Chapter Thirty Three. Early the next morning, Yi Chun told me, "I want to take you to see a pet dog." I'd never seen one before. Dogs were not allowed as pets in the city. Wild dogs ran in packs and came into the city at night. Officials often hunted them down and trapped them and beat them to death. I was intrigued by the idea of a pet dog. This was to be my first adventure in the countryside. We skipped out of the shed and ran along the path between the village huts. As we ran, a big black dog lunged at me, seemingly out of nowhere. He caught me from behind, growling ferociously, and bit hard on my right calf. I fell to the ground, screaming. The dog released me and ran away. I was bleeding and in terrible pain. Villagers came running from every direction when they heard my cries. One old woman approached, waving a large cleaver over her head, cursing the dog. She examined my injured leg and announced, "This is very serious." A crowd hovered around me, all of them shouting advice or asking what had happened. Because the local dialect was new to me, I could not understand most of what they said. It sounded like a hysterical clatter, and heightened my anxiety. The old woman quickly took charge and told one of the men to carry me home. The woman had a with weathered, wrinkled face and walked with a pronounced stoop. That diminished her slight stature. She was the shortest of the village women, but appeared to have unquestioned authority in this matter. The others instantly followed her orders without question. Hearing my cries, Mama was shocked to see a man carrying me. Yi Chun was also crying from fright. What happened? She asked. The old woman responded sharply, "Don't just stand there. Hurry up, and get some rice water." Rice water? Mama asked. "What is it?" "You city people," the woman shot back, impatiently. "Just put rice in water and stir it with your fingertips and give it to me, when the water colors." Mama grabbed a fistful of rice and stirred it in the bowl with water, and then handed it to the woman, who dipped her hands in it and washed my wound with the water. When it was clean, she sprinkled the rice water on my head. A moment later, her eyes rolled back in their sockets, and she turned her face toward the ceiling. And broke into a shrill, haunting incantation. Child, come home! Child, come home! Child, come home! The woman, the women who had followed her into our shed, joined with her immediately, and their chorus. Became a drone that grew louder each time they repeated the stanza. They closed their eyes and began waving their hands back and forth over their head, like long leaves of grass bending in some invisible wind. Mama was bewildered by all of this. She stood aside, shifting her gaze. Back and forth, from the women to me, wide-eyed, I was silent, mesmerized by the whole thing. I momentarily forgot the pain and fright from the dog bite. Quickly, the chant spread 
from dwelling to dwelling, as the villagers emerged and stood in front of their huts, raising their hands to the heavens and joining in. Peasants from the nearby fields heard and came running, chanting as they approached. After a while, the old woman stopped and everyone else quieted. She listened for something in the air. She looked at my mother and said, The dog that bit this girl scared her soul from her body. We're calling her soul home. If we don't, her soul will be wandering far away and she will lose it forever. At a signal, one of the women grabbed our broom and a young woman put me on her back. Another filled a small bowl with dry eyes. Then everyone left our shed and began parading in a long column through the village. The woman with the bowl of rice headed the procession. The woman carrying me followed close behind. The other woman, the other women, along with my mother, came after them. Children brought up the rear and joined in the chanting. They proceeded up and down the path through the village. The woman holding the broom, waving it back and forth in a wide arc to sweep away bad luck. The woman at the head of the parade threw rice in a circular motion as if planting. She kept repeating, Child, come alive. Child, come alive. When she threw the rice, chickens came running to snatch it. Eventually, the procession returned to the place where the dog had bitten me. At that point, a new chant began. It continued until the woman directing this ritual paused, closed her eyes, listened for something, and then relaxed. She made several silent circles around the spot and pronounced that my soul had returned. The crowd slowly dispersed. Mama carried me home. As she approached our shed, I remembered what had happened after she found me in the hospital in Hefei and asked, Mama, are they Christians? Did they baptize me? I felt her stiffen at my words. She slowed and turned a complete circle to make sure no one else could hear us. No, she said. I'll explain it to you when you grow up. Keep it a secret between the two of us for now. The nearest elementary school was a 20-minute walk from Gaul village. It consisted of three dirt floor rooms in a straw-roofed mud building. One room served as living quarters for the teacher, and the other two were classrooms. Students were required to bring their own stools and desks. I had a crude little three-legged stool about a foot tall. I had no desk. The elementary school system had recently shifted from six to five grades. Chairman Mao had issued a directive to, revolutionar to revolutionize the system and shorten the amount of time children spent in class. Grades 1 through 3 were instructed in one room and grades 4 and 5 in the other. I was in the fourth grade. In the countryside, girls attended school if at all, only through the third grade. After that, 
they worked in the fields. The peasants considered girls to be giveaways, meaning they would someday live with the family of their men. Consequently, educating them was a waste. I was the only girl in my classroom. There were half a dozen girls in the other room. Because I was the oldest girl in the school, it became my duty to cook for the teacher who lived at school. There was a large clay stove in the center of our classroom, and the teacher taught while I sat on my stool and tended the stove. The teacher himself had only an elementary school education, yet this distinguished him from the illiterate villagers. He was once a peddler, walking from village to village, beating on a little drum to attract people when he approached. He sold toys and candy. When the villagers needed a teacher for their children, they asked him to stay on. He had a son who was in my class. The teacher and his boy were unusual to us because they were members of the Uyghur minority of Western China, and they were Muslims. They no longer prayed openly each day. That was forbidden after the communists took over. But they did not eat pork, and during part of each year, they did not eat during the day. When he spoke privately with his son, none of us could understand a word. Some of the teacher's clothing was unusually colorful, as was a small rug he kept on the dirt floor of his living quarters. But perhaps most unusual was his practice of wearing shoes every day. Only in the dead of winter or during special celebrations like weddings did the peasants or their children wear shoes, but the teacher was never without his. When school was not in session, the teacher and his son did not mix with other villagers, nor did they join the groups working in the fields during planting and harvest. They kept to themselves and no one in the village seemed to mind. In Gao village, there was a curious absence of other girls my age. There were many girls three and four years older than me and some two or three years younger. But I was the only one born in 1958. Late one morning, while the other children were playing outside and the teacher was sitting at his desk smoking, I brought him his lunch and asked, Teacher Lu, wh why am I the only girl in the upper grade in this school? Where are the other girls my age? I don't even see them working in the fields. He responded thoughtfully and somberly. Once there were many little girls your age here. I remember passing through the villages in those years and seeing them. He paused wistfully and looked out the window at the sky. Where are they now, Teacher Lu? They are all dead. Did they get sick? No, he said, no. There was no sickness. He looked away and thought for a moment and sighed. <sighs> You're too young to understand, Yi Mao. He drew on his cigarette, held in the smoke for a time, then turned his face up and slowly exhaled, studying the blue spiral that floated on the air. 
as if trying to read meaning into it. He whispered, They died because there was no food. There was no food in any of these villages during that time. There was a famine. You don't know what that means, do you? I do, Teacher Lu. My grandma in Tianjin starved herself to save me during a famine. I felt a sudden urge to cry. <sighs> Maybe we shouldn't talk about this, he said sympathetically. I held back my tears and asked, What happened here? My wife did the same thing, he said. She saved all her food for our children. She died first. His voice broke and he paused for a moment. After she was gone, there was still not enough food. My daughter was five. My son was two. You remind me of my daughter. What happened to her? My daughter. He answered softly. Her name was Xiaobao, Little Treasure. I took my little treasure to Nanjing. I couldn't watch her starve. I told her I had a big surprise for her in the city. I took her to a Muslim restaurant near the drum tower. I can even remember the name of the restaurant, Ma Xiang Xing. I ordered her a plate of squirrel fish and a cup of tea. It cost two yuan, sixty fun. All the money I had. Her eyes lit up when she saw the food. She smiled for the first time in months and began eating. I watched her for a few minutes. I said, uh, Papa has to go to the latrine. You wait right here for me. She just nodded. She was too busy eating even to look at me. I walked to the door of the restaurant, turned and watched her eating at the table. Then I left. I never saw her again. That's how I remember her, sitting at a small table alone, eating eagerly. She was happy. Teacher Lu looked up at me, his eyes moist. I think she must look like you today. He continued eating, and I sat quietly across from him. When he was done, he stared at his empty bowl until I lifted it from his hands and carried it outside to wash it. End of chapter 33. Chapter 34. After school each day, the children immediately went to work. Their principal task was collecting animal droppings for fertilizer. I learned how to do this and soon was working beside them. This was my first real job. I wanted to be like the other children. I carried a small basket and rake and prowled the edge of the village looking for animal droppings. For every kilogram I delivered to the production team's sewage pour, the accountant recorded one work point for me, which was worth too fun. The first time I joined in the work, I wore a pair of liberation sneakers. 
The other children saw me and pointed and laughed. Look at the city girl, they said, collecting shit with shoes on. I went home and put my shoes away. As long as we lived in the village, I went barefoot most of the time. It hurt at first, but soon the soles of my feet had hardened with calluses and I could go anywhere painlessly. I was even able to walk across hot stones in the summer or climb on sharp-edged rocks. Some afternoons, I was accompanied on my searches by a neighbor girl named Little Rabbit. She was only five, but very intelligent for her age. She had a baby brother who was bound to her back every morning. Carrying him, she trudged along beside me as I did my work. I began to spend most of my spare time with Little Rabbit. Slowly, she took the place in my life that Xiaolan once filled. She reminded me of myself when I was five, doing the household chores and caring for my younger brother. I taught her some of the games I played when I was her age. I made a length of rope from straw and tied one end to a post and turned the other and taught her how to jump rope. She was delighted. I also showed her how to make bird nests out of grass roots. Little Rabbit taught me how to catch fish in the irrigation ditch. The water ran swiftly from the pond to the rice fields when the dikes were open. She knelt at the water's edge, leaned down and blocked a section of the ditch with a bamboo basket to snag fish. Within minutes, she pulled up half a dozen fish. We called them Tan Tiao, little white fish. They were only about three inches long. He, we cleaned them and cooked them and made a feast for ourselves. Little Rabbit was not healthy. She tired easily. On our shopping trips to the brigade store, she often had to stop and rest and complained that she had a headache. Sometimes I tried to help her and had her transfer her baby brother to my back. She behaved like an old woman rather than a child. I did everything I could to cheer her up. I remembered how I had become ill and my energy had drained away, but had eventually been taken to the hospital. Someone had cared for me and wanted me to live. Little Rabbit appeared to have no one like that. Her parents and grandmother were indifferent. She liked me to tell her stories. When we sat together making straw fuel bundles for the stove, I'd tell her stories and sometimes she'd tip toward me and rest her head against my shoulder. I talked with Mama about her and she said Little Rabbit should go to the clinic at the commune headquarters. She suggested this to Little Rabbit's mother who told her there was nothing wrong with the child and that she had always been listless and quiet. One morning, Little Rabbit came to our shed and asked me to walk with her to the brigade store. Her grandmother wanted her to buy soy sauce. I also had to go to the store to buy salt. I scooped up a few fun and joined her. But when we had walked only a short distance, she stopped and said she wasn't feeling well. She appeared unusually pale. She also had the burden of her little brother strapped to her back. I touched her forehead and told her, your skin is hot, little rabbit. Go home. I'll get your soy sauce. 
She handed me her money. I hurried to the store and bought the supplies and saved a single fun. The store had yam candy for sale, one fun each. I bought a piece for Little Rabbit. I ran most of the way home, imagining the broad smile that would boom, bloom on her face when I handed her the treat. As I entered her front yard, I saw her lying in the straw with her little brother tied to her back. Sleeping soundly, little rabbit was on her side with her legs drawn up, clutching an unknown batch of straw. I called to her, "Little rabbit, I have a surprise for you." She didn't move. I thought she must be asleep. I sat down next to her on the straw, and wrapped the candy. And held it out to her. Only then did I notice that her eyes were half open. I touched her face, and found she was cold. I cried out and ran to the door of her shed, and summoned her grandmother. She hurried outside and saw little rabbit and scooped her up. In her arms, and began calling to her and stroking her forehead. The baby boy tied to Little Rabbit's back began crying. I loosened the cloth that bound him to Little Rabbit and held him. Little Rabbit lay as limp as a rag doll in her grandmother's arms. The old woman began wailing. Other women heard the commotion and came running. When they saw Little Rabbit in her grandmother's arms, they too began screaming and crying. I continued staring at Little Rabbit in disbelief, still clutching the candy I had bought for her. That evening, several men dug a grave outside the village. They wrapped Little Rabbit in a blanket and lay her in the grave and covered her. There was no marker. There was no ceremony. During the next weeks, I walked to her graveside every day. Once I found that animals had scratched away at the surface, I piled more dirt on the grave, and stumped it down. When I was finished, I sat down, and talked to Little Rabbit. End of chapter thirty-four.